So what's the third? Over and over. What's the third uh, half truth of Wall Street, Peter? Well, this is the one that drives me absolutely bonkers. I mean, bonkers. If you ever want to just come up to me and um, get me going, mention this one. Okay. And this one is probably the one and when I was taught back in February of 2002, um, when I started in the business on the financial advisory or the financial planning side, this is what they taught you. It's just a paper loss. And I accepted that for the longest time. And then one day it just hit me and I said, wait, when the market's going up like a rocket ship, does, has a financial advisor ever called up a client and said, hey, Jack, I just want to let you know, it's just a paper gain. Those aren't real gains. But the minute that the market crashes, what do they do when the client calls up all concerned? Jack, don't worry, just a paper loss. Come on. This is, well, this is probably the most hypocritical thing. So I would bet anybody that watches this, if anyone, if your advisor's ever said it's just a paper loss, I give you permission to punch them in the face. Now, I'm just kidding when I say that, okay? I don't want you to punch your advisor anybody in the face. Me metaphorically. Right, right. Metaphorically speaking. I mean, it is like, this drives me bonkers. Like my head wants to explode when I hear that. Yeah, yeah. And- the 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 response is always the same. Keep your money in the market. If the market's crashing down, no, 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 don't touch it. You don't want to take out money when it's down. You want to wait for it to recover. Well, first of all, what if I don't have a choice? What if I need the money, right? Which when the market is crashing, that's probably when I'm most likely to have a need for the money because I lost my job. Maybe I had some health issue, right? All kinds of things, right? When the market is screaming up and you say, hey, I want to realize some gains. No, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Right. Like, so when am I? Apparently, I'm never supposed to sell. There's never a good time to sell, apparently. Right. It's just buy, 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 and keep buying. Right. Um, and let me tell you a story about this. So, 2008, um, I have, you know, clients, and I had one client in particular, um, and I had them in a diversified portfolio course about 60 40 stocks and bonds with one of the most largest mutual fund companies out there and everything blew up and his account got destroyed and he was literally on the verge of retirement and at that point he wrote it down and my the only thing you can do then i mean I was like, you can't sell now, right? That's the problem. It happens, but people don't get it. They think that they think in their head they might be able to get out. You will not be able to get out in time. Just like August 5th, when the VIX went from 15 to 65, you will not be able to get out in time. And then what's going to happen? The advisor is going to say, it's just the paper loss. You're going to write it down. And then what the worst part about that is, okay, Let's hypothetically, let's go back to buy and hold for a second. If you buy and hold, it'll come back. Yeah, but you weren't able to take advantage of it. One of the greatest opportunities is the time when things crash, and yet you're going to write it down. So how can you take advantage of it? Do you see? It doesn't make any sense. And it took most of my, it took 16 years in this business. So I had that moment where I was like, all this stuff I was taught. Um, it's not right. Yeah, and maybe you know? sort of three A on that is what Garrett Gunderson talks about. About um, you know, because Peter talks about the main three myths, half truths, sales tactics, whatever you want to call them of Wall Street. There are plenty of others, and they all come as like corollaries. One is uh, dollar cost averaging. So according to Garrett Gunderson, dollar cost averaging is how Wall Street solves the problem of how do we get you to give us your money all the time, whether the market's going up, down, or sideways, keep giving us your money. Well, they came up with dollar cost averaging, right, which is basically saying, hey, you can't possibly time the market, so just take a certain chunk of money and give it to us every month, every quarter, whatever the cadence is, and just keep putting it into the market, right? That's the idea of dollar right. cost averaging. And, and again, there's some truth behind it there's some truth behind it but it's twisted into so now you just give us our money gives your money all the time on an ongoing systematic basis right and no matter what the market is doing just keep buying 
keep buying, keep buying. But obviously, as Peter is pointing out, what would be better than writing the market down and then waiting for the agonizing process of it to come back up and then finally go beyond what you what you had, which, by the way, there was a guy I was talking to, um, same thing, his positions crashed in 2009. Really, they didn't get back to a reasonable um, gain until 2014, right? So you're talking, yeah, you're talking like five, six years to get back to the point where you've gotten your money back plus a reasonable gain, right? Well, five to six years of lost opportunity cost is huge, especially. Imagine if it was, imagine if it was 30 years. Imagine, like, look at our, if, go on to whatever website you want to look at. Go look at the NASDAQ right now. It looks like the Nikkei 225 back in 1989. It's probably even higher. What happens? I like to ask this question. What happens, Logan? If your portfolio doesn't come back by, for 30 years, would that harm you and your family? Well, not me because ever... I don't put money into those assets. So I would, my, I'd be my, like you. I'd be like, me. yes, yes, to have the market crash. I'll, I'll be waiting by the sideline to buy it, buy stuff on the cheap, right? <laughs> now, there, I'm immediately going to get attacked for that, saying I'm an extremist. Look, it happened in Japan at the time, the second largest economy. What do we have going on in the country right now? And I think this is a good way to close out this segment, but it's we have we're taking on a trillion dollars of national debt now every hundred days roughly in this country. Right? It's a mess. People can't afford, by the way, I just heard now 20% of all homeowners don't even have homeowners insurance because they can't afford the premiums. Auto insurance is through the roof. Inflation's out of control, even though the government wants to pretend that inflation's under control. It's a mess right now. And I like to ask this question, do you think there'll be more or less volatility in the future? And they always say, well, of course, a lot more. Well, isn't that going to affect your overall portfolios? And shouldn't you build in some risk management tools that will allow you to mitigate that risk and at the same time take advantage of it? And I'm so... I'm not a Debbie Downer. People always accuse me of talking about bad news. I am super excited right now, Logan, and I think you are too. Because if you're not harmed by the bad stuff and you have still have complete access to your money, doesn't that mean you can take advantage of every single government, Wall Street, and bank screw up going forward? Wouldn't that be an amazing strategy and why aren't you doing that, right? Yep. So there are two things I would say to that. First of all, I just... I reject the whole premise because I'm not playing probabilities. So whether the market is going up, down, or sideways, happily, I don't care. It doesn't affect me, right? I don't I don't want to ever play probabilities. That's not what I do. Now, I might take a small, small percentage of, of my assets, I don't use the word portfolio, and speculate, right? But that's play money that I put to the side, and I'm hoping for like thousand percent ten thousand percent gains otherwise it's not worth the risk it's not worth the loss of liquidity access and control right so it's got to be we're not talking 12 percent returns we're talking life-changing returns right um right like putting it into and, like and, uh, and, bitcoin and just letting it ride right like say hey that that five or ten percent or three percent of my portfolio we're going to put it in something crazy and we're just going to let, if it, if it goes up to a million, great. If it goes to zero, it doesn't wipe me out, right? That's okay. When you have a portfolio structured properly, you can take those moonshots. I regret not buying Amazon after the dot-com bubble burst, right? I could have bought Amazon at like a buck or less than a buck. That would have been, probably been a pretty good um, investment. I did buy, by the way, Lock, I'll never forget this. Now, today, I wouldn't have invested in this company just because they're a defense contractor, but it was like 99. I bought Lockheed Martin and I doubled my money on it and got out. It was the worst thing ever. If you look at Lockheed stock now with all the wars we've fought and everything else. Um, so, yeah. Well, the other the other thing I was going to say, the second thing is um, the smart money makes a ton of money in a crash that's really what separates the men from the boys right so the average investor gets wiped out and they just have to wait for the market to come back right that's not what the smart money is doing so this is probably an outdated statistic but 
Um, there were more millionaires made in this country during the Great Depression than at any other time in American history. And that was back when a million dollars was a lot of money, right? It's not as much today. So what happens with wealthy people is they're making slow, steady gains during the good times, and then they make enormous gains during the bad times because that's when all the assets are available on the cheap. That's when there's just enormous opportunity there, right? Uh, if you're not following the buy and hold strategy, right? If you're not saying it's just a paper loss, right? If you're not saying higher the risk, higher the reward, right? Yeah, I mean, look at Warren Buffett right now. He just sold a good chunk of his Apple stock, Bank of America. He's sitting on record amounts of cash. And and Buffett is, it's interesting. He's always okay with getting out of the market early, right? Yeah, you can never, because they, it's funny, Peter, because they talk out of both sides of their mouth, right? They say you can't time the market, right? It's like, okay, but if you can't time the market, I still have to sell at some point. So if I can't time the market, isn't there a huge risk of when I sell, i.e. sequence of returns risk, right? So what, right. what smart people will do is they don't try to time the exact top, but they'll get out in like 20% increments, you know, near the top right so you've got to sell at some point or else you're not benefiting at all right yeah and i i think it comes down to where, where are you at in the you know in your life right are you retired you know or on the verge of retiring or just where you're where you at you know you got to take that into consideration because all i know is if i'm on the verge of retirement or retired and i got a good chunk of my portfolio in the markets, there's, I'd be terrified right now because I, I think there's a lot of volatility coming. Now, I think we're going to get through this stuff, but around 2030 or so is when I believe that really bad stuff is coming. But, you know, we have between now and election day in November, I think we're going to see a lot of volatility. I really do. And so, if you're using I, options, volatility is your friend. If you're selling options, not buying options, okay, selling options, the premium on those options contracts goes through the roof when there's volatility, right? So again, when the average investor is getting hammered and they're fearful and everything, smart investors are making their money and they're doing it with less risk, right? Because uh, selling options is not the same as buying options, right? When you sell an option, you make your money when you're selling, right? So there's a premium, that you collect, but yeah, uh, and I just want to say about that. I don't, I can't, I don't want to get into specific recommendations or anything like that. I'm not doing that, but you can, you know, there's a lot of good, for example, ETFs out there. If you want to control the the volatility, there's a lot of companies that have already packaged that into an ETF, for example, so that you, if you don't know, you know, that's where you want to be working with an advisor. But absolutely, do you want to have some, you know. Um, some protection to protect the uh, if volatility goes through the roof. Yeah, you you should have some built into that portfolio. And I don't think many, honestly, whether you know, but, I don't but think many. Why, people what? Have. But Peter, no, seriously, why is volatility a bad thing? I don't see why I should be afraid of volatility. If someone's afraid of volatility, it indicates to me they're investing the wrong way, right? Volatility right. means more volatility means more opportunity, right? So. But if you're following buy and hold, yeah, that is kind of scary because you're seeing your positions go all over the place, right? And volatility is funny because vol no one minds volatility to the upside, right? <laughs> if your position skyrockets higher, that's great, right? It's only volatility to the downside, right? Right. You know, I talk about that all the time. There's, look, you know, if you can participate in the good volatility but never be harmed by the bad volatility, when would you want to know about something like that? before or after the next crash and they're like well before right but people just always think volatility is bad and it's not actually right now i'm excited out of my mind i want the most volatility i can get my hands on because if i'm not gonna if the floor is what hypothetically say is zero let that baby crash right and then we'll ride it back up it's the greatest opportunity ever but you can't be a hundred percent in the buy and hold strategy because you can't take advantage of it. I, I see no point of that. Maybe 50-50, okay? Maybe 50-50 we can say. I, I don't even know if it's I would be 50-50 right now, but 50-50 I could say, okay, 
you know, 50% vested, 50% cash or cash value life insurance or an annuity or something like that, so that you're in position to take advantage of it, I would be okay with that. But 100% in, in the market right now? So what is the goal, right? The goal is not to get build a nest egg. The goal is not to get a great return on investment. The goal is financial independence. That is the goal. I want to be financially independent. And how do you do that? It's all about income. You want to generate multiple streams of safe, reliable, passive income. That's how you do it. And you're not going to be able to do that by following the Wall Street approved method where you're just basically building a nest egg and it's all based on probability and you have no control over the outcome. So you need to find strategies that are going to increase your income. That's what it's all about, right? So that's what... Uh, I try to do when I'm investing, I'm investing for cash flow. I'm not investing for return on investment. Now I will speculate some, but I'm clear about what I'm doing that I'm speculating. If I'm talking about return on investment, I'm speculating. And that's money that now I have to use very small position sizes. And you want to have a large amount of cash capital in cash value life insurance, right? Just slow and steady wins the race. So we covered a lot there, Peter, and we went down a lot of rabbit holes, uh, you know, but uh, is there anything you want to say in closing? I would just like to say, I, I think right now with the uncertainty in the markets and the volatility, um, what we've talked about, these three myths of Wall Street, the buy and hold, higher the risk, higher the reward, and just the paper loss. Anybody that's watching this, I hope you take serious consideration and either taking some money off the table right now or to reach out to us and a lot, you know, that we can help you with it. But I think there's a lot of bad stuff coming down the road and it's just math. Okay. It's not my opinion. It's math. David Walker, the former comptroller of the United States, which is like the CPA of the USA. He said the same thing in the past until the country decides the government actually starts trying to fix our economy, which it's not. And I'm not even going to get into politics because I don't. I haven't heard either candidate, or all three candidates, if you will include uh, the independent. They're not talking about the out of control national debt, and this is going to create a lot of issues going forward. But once again, my closing thing is, you know, do you want to be harmed by all the bad stuff, or would you rather be put in a position where you can take advantage of it? But you're, you know, you have a choice. What, what do you want to do? All right. And on that note, those were the three half truths. We'll call them the three marketing slogans uh, of Wall Street that are sort of true, but uh, not really. So thanks so much for your time, Peter. Look forward to the next one. All right. God bless. Godspeed.